Yeah, so um, welcome everyone to our race seminar in September with a very interesting topic on ML ops with a particular tool called ClearML. Um, however, we will also introduce a little bit the idea behind ML ops and also then we'll give alternative tools also as one idea, of course, how you can do it. And clear ML will be one focus as another idea of doing it. But of course, there's a rich tool set around and these are just examples. So when we get started um, today here, um, basically we have the following agenda. I will basically introduce a little bit why ML ops is relevant in our center of excellence, uh, why it's related to AI, and why is it actually very much problematic um, to just not use some tools like that? So shed a little bit of light in this, although I will go much more in deep why the complexity is so tough that we need tools like you know ML flow, clear ML, essentially those that actually completely have the AI lifecycle supported. And of course, it's not obvious to you what means AI lifecycle, what means uh, DevOps, ML ops, which are actually intertwined. And this is something what I provide in roughly 40 minutes in the second talk. And then we have the practice and experience from um, Dr. Kurt de Grave, uh, who is with me here, also one of the speakers today, that really shows a little bit how ClearML works um, in experiments. So let's say um, to really explore how the look and feel of these products is from ClearML. So of course, um, taking into um, kind of lessons learned and feedback, we did now many seminars and um, from the discussions now in the past, I revealed a little bit that, you know, we are always missing out question and answer sessions. And that's why you see I compressed a little bit the, little, the beginning part so that we hopefully have in the end a bit more time this time for questions and so on. And then I will basically just wrap up the seminar and give you an outlook to our seminar, which is probably coming in October. So from the speakers, um, let's go here. And I should mention, of course, if you want to know more about our center of excellence race, here's our beautiful website um, that you see here under coe-race.eu. And the seminar speakers that we have today is, as I said, Dr. Kurt de Grave. I hope I spelled that right, <laughs> Kurt. Uh, he is a senior researcher in artificial intelligence at Flanders Make, which is a nonprofit company. But I think Kurt will also in his talk then, you know, introduce a little bit about the company, also a little bit what is now basically the AI models they actually considered to be using with tools like ClearML or MLflow to support the MLOps. And well, my name is Professor Moritz Riedel. I'm actually teaching high performance computing here at the University of Iceland, but I'm also a research group leader at the Uni Supercomputing Center in Germany since around 17 years. So I have quite some experience in HPC and everywhere where we will talk basically today, I will make some connections to HPC in particular, because that's of course what our COE race in particular is um, tackling with a particular light of Exascale as well. Should also mention that I'm the Euro HPC Joint Undertaking Governing Board member of Iceland. And um, this is of course an interesting position to see how, also how relevant AI as such is now becoming in all the different future activities, very closely intertwined with HPC. So the CUE race in this position has a very, let's say central role from all the center of excellences that we have um, essentially in the your HPC undertaking. In this sense, it's also quite a unique project, so to speak. Just let me share in this regard also that this um, seminar is essentially therefore also co-organized by our um, National Competence Center eHPC, so Icelandic HPC, uh, with civil simulation and data labs, which have our experience in many, many different application domains, you can see here, and basically where we have all experts in HPC um, using also, of course, AI models here and there, uh, like in the remote sensing lab or natural language processing lab, for instance. You see here also, we are kind of a moderate size university, um, still having very many foreign and Erasmus students in Iceland um, that are always part of our courses. Or we have, let's say, also many joint PhDs with many different international players. And one of our key collaborators was essentially around nine joint PhD students right now. Uh, in this particular field of HPC is the Uli Supercomputing Center in Germany. 
and we are working closely together basically in the deep series of projects that had the strategy of creating so-called modular supercomputers in the futures based on these different modules and then hopefully reaching exascale and as such being very relevant then for CUE race to have these models scaling up towards exascale in the 2024 time frame basically the end or towards the end of the CUE race um, although, of course, the Euro HPC undertaking things a little bit long term, so the center of excellence is in a way should be longer existing, but of course it also has to be assessed how good they are and how much they actually provide for the communities. You see a little bit um, from the Icelandic perspective also another modular system called Lumi in Finland. Iceland is also part of this consortium, which is, let's say, having a pre scale system essentially here. Um, also starting to be operating in Finland with, a, let's say, 10 other countries that join forces in that regard. So if you want to know more, of course, about the modular design setup that we all, let's say, drive here together, um, here is a very nice YouTube video. If you just go to um, YouTube and say jewels, then you quickly get the idea what essentially um, this modular idea is. In Europe, this is highly relevant because it's compared to other countries in US or China, we cannot afford to have this large, large, large homogeneous um, hyperscaler like uh, computing entities. In contrast, we're thinking much more application oriented. That's why you see here also the word application co-design is one of the most important part um, to basically think about what the applications can take mostly out of these HPC systems. All right, so I think that's for the first part. Um, again, if you want to know more about race, it's a very good website. Let me just go to the next talk, which is essentially the role of MLOps in CUE race. So when we talk now about this, um, basically, of course, COE race is a relatively large project. I would take um, probably an whole hour from our seminar today to just talk about this particular project. So I picked, of course, the different pieces um, out later, which is relevant for the ML ops and also for the clear ML focus we have today. But um, before we do this, we still start a little bit with a race understanding what we do in COE race and then come slowly why actually this is so relevant essentially for us. So again, the website, I think I talked now several times about this. One of the motivation or approaches is really to think about two kind of complementary approaches in race. Once we have the physics driven simulation and experiments, um, actually large scale simulations using HPC based on numerical methods, based on known physical laws. So this is something which is one big part of race and then really combining this with the other methodologies that we have in AI. So artificial intelligence like machine learning and deep learning. And of course, as it is a center of excellence in the Euro HPC endeavor, we really talk here about those um, simulation and experiments uh, combined with AI technologies that scale up. So 10 to the 18 here stands largely for extra scale. In other words, we really think about big data. We think about really big modeling and um, also simulations that really require exascale computing in the future. As such, this is a kind of unique project, as I said, from the COE perspective. Many of them have much more an application focus, like for combustion, for instance. Here in COE race, we kind of have still the engineering kind of focus, but a relatively broad set of use cases. So you see here on the left-hand side, more computer-driven use cases um, from turbulent flow up to the engine design of new um, hydrogen helicopters. One example is here an AI for wind farm uh, layout that you see that we try to model and then also complement the surrogate modeling with AI technologies. On the other hand, we have also um, more data-driven use cases in CUE race, which are reaching from fundamental physics with CERN. It's a large hadron collider uh, down in Geneva, but also others like manufacturing, which actually will be also a little bit, let's say, presented by Kurt or more or less introduced because that's basically the use case where he is also driving these uh, clear ML and also the uh, research here in race. Um, as such, 
basically looking at all of them, of all this kind of nine use cases you can imagine, there's always a lot of data involved um, that could be either generated by the simulations or there are lots of machine learning models that are coming out of this or models, as I said, on physical laws. And this is, of course, now something where we have to work with, where we basically in, in race um, have to understand what that really means. Because in many of these areas and what relates to the seminar today is really, it's not just one that you see here, the one golden data pile or the one golden model that you see. This should basically a little bit show you already that the models are really different. They're basically um, a, a huge set of variety that can be coming out of this. And in this sense, we need to manage all of this complexity. And I will make the case later, just that you understand a little bit that of course, here we don't talk about just a one shot thing. This is done, the use case, it gives you data. It's a cycle, it's a development cycle that we do in, in CEO race to essentially come to something we call the unique AI framework, which then actually is able to scale to extra scale and then also can be used by all these use cases. What that means is that we look at scaling of basically different codes. So with different frameworks like Horovod, we looked at DeepSpeed, but also PyTorch has an inherent um, scaling up framework inside. We're looking on different AI methods. It's of course clear. We're looking on, on those which are for image recognition like convolutional networks or uh, imaging technologies or other technologies like autoencoders or short-term memory is another example for more sequence data analysis like gated recorded units as well. So it's basically a rich facet in the AI world, but always with a specific view to computing, of course, as you see with the scaling up of Horobot uh, and so forth. Combined to this is of course, benchmarking those and really think about how good are they when they scaling up? So can they really go towards extra scale or where do we see limits? Um, how it re relates to uh, advanced approaches in machine learning, really, like transfer learning, take an old model, having it trained and reusing it maybe and just scaling more higher. Is that possible? So these are activities which actually complement the activities in the AI world. Also looking a lot of how that has a footprint in the HPC usage. You immediately can uh, imagine if you have then also this hyperparameter tuning there's endless capabilities and possibilities in these models. So you basically can forever tune if you want. Um, and this of course has a very, very large footprint on computing needs and of course, partly also in storage needs. So what, something what we want to evolve to in the CEU race is certainly something like this unique AI framework, which of course is based on open source community tools on best practices in HPC, how to scale up to exascale and then also taking our, let's say, lessons learned and practice into account that we had in EuroHPC, Praise, and all the, let's say, different projects already that tackling in parallel with us also some of the challenges um, towards Exascale, like the Admire project, for instance, in the EuroHPC endeavors, which actually are thinking about IO and much more data oriented elements. However, here in Raise, we focus a bit on this AI framework, taking into account requirements that you saw from this computing and data-driven use cases. But of course, another set of requirements really comes in from the different hardware we're gonna expect these days. So many of you know, GPUs are largely driven by NVIDIA, but soon we have AMD, um, basically MI100 cards to deal with, or we have graph processors coming, um, which is a new idea. And of course, then at the end of the other scales would be quantum computing. So these are things which we tackle in race and always relate how that reflects now in AI modeling, how that gives benefits. And also software infrastructure is something which is, you know, perhaps, or many of you know as well, very lively in the AI community, perhaps not so extremely lively in the HPC community, but in the AI community, there are almost frameworks every month, which are new, which have been, you know, revised or which actually are merged. Um, and one of those is actually where we talk about today. Um, Clear ML was not long existing. It was called Allegio and was basically by Google. Um, so it tells you that there's lots of, uh, let's say, drive and momentum around these frameworks that we all try to look at and basically then shape and also our unique AI framework that I will present a little bit as the first blueprint also as part of this talk here. The so process how we went to this kind of, um, let's say, 
unique AI framework went to fact sheets. So we looked a little bit from the 10,000 feet perspective, which components are at all relevant. And then basically from this, having done that, we cooked much more which machine and deep learning approaches are of interest, which libraries, which codes, uh, which toolkits really are uh, relevant. And then of course, which hardware we need in terms of HPC usage. Um, we don't really focus on, let's say quantum computing and graph computing, so to speak, uh, right now. But we already have, let's say, access to some of those systems. And in the next year, we'll probably already do our baby steps on these systems. So an interesting time. Here are just some examples of these fact sheets. You see here um, also nicely that they are having and catching, let's say, this 10,000 feet perspective very well, shed lights of some specific, let's say, challenges or just a very nice view to understand where containers play a role here, for instance, or where certain use cases have really a chance of scaling up or being easily used with, you know, let's say kernels that have been self-created for a specific use case. So of course I cannot go into the details of this, but the interesting thing is many use cases, basically all use cases in COE Rays have now one fact sheet which we polish and will be also available um, basically very soon. So from all of these fact sheets, um, one key message to take away is, of course, what are the AI methods that matter in all of those? So you see here a very old matrix that we created before we even actually got the project. So during the submission time of our proposal, where we already thought a little bit about which methods are really relevant for these different use cases. And you can see also the fact sheets are quite a work in progress. So but this is science. This is research. So we have to investigate. We have to understand what is possible and also what we want, of course, thinking always about the scientific use case in the back. Uh, we don't want to do AI for fun. We want to have something uh, coming out of these use cases in terms of results. And this is, of course, a bit um, something where it is really a process of communication. It's really going through all of the different steps with all the different teams with different expertise. You have experts in AI and you have experts in the simulation sciences much more physics driven. So, and they have to talk together, you know, bridging this gap, so to speak, that has been existing, I think for these communities uh, over quite some time now, looking back in my last 17 years in HPC. So I think this is something where we use the interaction room. Also, this is something where I cannot go in all the details, but um, also here as a pointer, we have a YouTube channel where we all put all seminars. And one of our first seminars we did was the interaction room seminar to understand this methodology, which is also something coming out of race really as an outcome here with a particular view on HPC, and which is actually now just taken up by the Admire projects, also uh, actually implementing the interaction room methodology. Now, what came out when we you know, did all of these, um, let's say, interesting interaction rooms based on mural boards? It was a technology because we had COVID-19, could not really meet together, so we had to do this online, of course. So we use the mural technology, but the, let's say, conclusion is that we have a much more fine-grained situation in all these different use cases that you here see on the left side. And then also here, essentially, all the different models on the other side. Um, this stands here for graph neural networks, and of course, the different convolutional neural networks existing based on units or residual networks. And this might be even more refined during the course of the project. This is, of course, just a snapshot you see here also continuously updating. It's a little bit also reflecting what, why we need MLOps a little bit and thinking about this. And I will shed light on this because, of course, in a way, you never finished with this, right? This matrix would be never finished because you always want to maybe move to another model or maybe combine models, which is actually shown here nicely with the RBF and ANN, a radial basis function combined with a typical artificial neural network approach. So, but essentially this would take another hour to talk about all the models, just to take away the message that all the use cases have of course, different needs, different data sets. As such, we have much different models. And of course, people combine models like a convolution autoencoder that is maybe enriched with some physics informed machine learning here. So these are um, just examples now and again, the race project is there and of course you can contact us and the use cases if you want to know more about these elements. Now basically just providing you with a rough blueprint and where now essentially the role of MLOps is in all of this. I was alluding to this a little bit already. 
was that we have a very complicated setup of technology. You see that here in the interesting, let's say, unique AI framework blueprint for Exascale that we have right now in the RACE project. It's, of course, a draft, so we'll be also continuously updated. But we're thinking about really all of these different use cases uh, requiring very often the presence of so-called Jupyter notebooks and Jupyter labs that are then able to actually access HPC resources on the lower level and hopefully also supporting container technology. So these are all requirements that came to us from all these different use cases. And of course, some already also had stated that they want to prefer also the traditional access, which is much more about SSH. And for some of the scaling technologies we use in the project, like Horovod or so, and here and there scaling up really to many different GPUs, maybe there sometimes is just batch subscripts uh, much, much better to use than necessarily interactive Jupyter notebooks. But for model exploration, for doing machine learning, Jupyter is a kind of technology of choice. However, bringing them together with HPC resources is then quite challenging. You need specific kernels that are working inside this Jupyter notebook environment to work with the specific HPC systems because all of them have the complexity really of having what you see here, different AI packages in different versions, TensorFlow 1, TensorFlow 2, PyTorch, different versions of Python. Um, there are lots of challenges of getting the right basically toolkits together and then also providing the modules on the HPC machines on all these different resources. And now if you're a user on the, on the highest end here, you maybe don't want to know the details of the BSC system in Spain or the modular HPC system jewels that we have in Jülich or one of the prototypes you want to use. So here, one of the ideas of this unique AI framework is to leverage standards like the ONX standard here with the Open Neural Network Exchange standard as one example to abstract away from all the complexities from these different modules available on these systems. We just maybe indicate that we want to use TensorFlow but we don't specify exactly which concrete model and which specific version. So this can be done by the framework. And also what we do is, of course, in parallel, we check these versions. So we check out if Horowat is scaling, how good is scaling, where are the drawbacks. Then also PyTorch is, is basically uh, analyzed in terms of scaling. And often we found um, trade-offs, which we also put in some of our deliverables, which we, and also, of course, will publish later in papers where you maybe think like sometimes the efficiency of PyTorch is very good when it scales high by increased batch sizes. But when you look on the validation accuracy, it unfortunately drops relatively quickly compared to Horowat because basically Horowat keeps the validation accuracy quite high for a much longer period or much higher batch sizes, but then suddenly, of course, it is not so efficient anymore. So, you, of course, as a machine learning researcher, in a way, you're really much more interested in validation accuracy and as such, this is, of course, a concern where we also have to work on. And of course, you can see, um, I can talk about this framework alone the whole day, but for us is now the question, how could these flow, uh, how basically could these tools like MLflow, like ML, these operations tools help us in that regard? They share the same problem in many facets because they work with cloud vendors and lots of them as one of my next talks and also Kurt will a little bit elaborate on. So they are, of course, oriented to the markets, right? So that means lots of cloud resources in Amazon Web Services, MS Azure, or even basically then using the Google Cloud Platform. Um, these are things where um, they share, however, many of the concerns we have. When we do modeling, we will see again and again another model and another model and another data set. So we kind of keep losing track of all the different versions. And then when you think about companies that want to automate this process, for customers, we have several companies on board. Atos is one, but also Flanders Make is a kind of nonprofit still um, having, let's say, a, a bit of business character there. So in this sense, they want to automate the process for customers to think about um, these models and bring them also to the market. And here is a kind of concern where also CU Race has certain overlaps. On the one hand, we want, of course, leverage those products to think about could we really reuse certain elements of it to really keep track. And you will see in clear ML, it's sometimes relatively easy. You just import two lines with a Python code, so, and then you suddenly track a lot of things you do. On the other hand, of course, we want to see if our framework remains interoperable, right? We don't want to create everything new. 
Um, that's why we reuse TensorFlow and PyTorch and can be also interoperable with these technologies that we also will explain a little bit today. Right, so, but in a way, um, this is of course a very big um, endeavor here for the next three years. So this is just the very first blueprint that we came up with based on the first round really of requirement analysis in the project. But of course here we will refine this over time. I would say a break here shortly. I see in the chat the short questions. Um, our research institute is Flanders make, okay? Yeah, could, yeah, I think you should just introduce it properly when you basically, um, basically then, you know, do your presentation. Thank you very much, however, for the correction. Right, um, we have a question and answer session at the end of the um, seminar today. That's why I would say I just go ahead. But of course, if you then also have questions to raise, if you have questions to basically the COE as such, or this interesting framework I just mentioned, um, but we will come back to this, of course, also very soon again. But note your questions, put them maybe already in the chat, then we maybe can already react in the uh, seminar, uh, basically, on it. But now it's the time for the next presentation, where I introduce you a little bit about what ML Ops really means and how it relates to tools like Clear ML and basically also um, ML Flow a little bit. So um, again, um, this is just basically a very brief introduction to MLOps. This is a topic where you today probably could fill a complete lecture series in the university. It's a very rich topic. It fulfills the whole AI life cycle and has, of course, overlaps with software engineering, with DevOps operations that maybe some people will know from normal software um, and deploying normal in terms of saying um, the non-AI software that is basically not so iterative maybe in these versions. And this exactly is one of the motivation for MLOps, which I come to. Hence, I will provide some foundations and say, how are data scientists really working and what are the limits that they actually uh, basically by doing so chaotic, um, let's say analysis of the data and modeling will basically have to really have all the overview but this is related, of course, in the extreme complexity of the AI lifecycle. Life it would be easy and we can just keep track of the versions very easily ourselves. As data scientists, then we didn't need these tools, but we will very quickly see in the foundations that actually the common practice in machine learning is quite chaotic and that the MLOps approach can at least help to really track some of these concerns that we have. And this is already chaotic and a little bit, let's say, um, not systematic when you think about not using HPC, but just having a little laptop with Sky Kit Learn. Already there, it starts basically to become chaotic if you have lots of different versions of your model, if you switch between different models. So we look a little bit also into the general modus operandi of machine learning. What do we mean by different models? What, how it relates to hypothesis sets? And why is there such an explosion of numbers of models you can really have? And this is, of course, then one of the key motivations of MLOps to keep track of those and pick those then maybe that are really relevant for business or for basically production to automate then also the deployment to run really 24 seven for infrareds, right? It's also a very important topic often not really looked at. Of course, we're training machine learning models to become better and better, but at some point in time, we want to have a product or we basically have a whole pipeline of putting new data in and want just to use the model in production 24 seven. So at the end day of the foundations, we look a little bit on differences and commonalities um, to the typical DevOps, which exists in actually software applications of engineering. And then I thought it might be a good idea to have just an ML flow example as a video. It's a very short video, a bit practical, but it gives a bit credit that clear ML admittedly is not the only technology around. So we maybe in future versions of the seminar series will also do an ML flow uh, seminar. But just that you get the message that there are, of course, different tools with a slightly different angle here and there. Um, we have a short video and ML flow basically at the end of the selected foundations. Afterwards, um, basically, when we have done this video, you already have, I think, a very good idea what roughly this ML ops is. Of course, as I said, it's a quite complicated topic and it, it, it has the whole AI life cycles. So we could talk about this 
for quite a long time, but we just have a, let's say, two hour seminar here. Um, the second part would be clearly oriented then more about clear ML. It helps us reflect on the video and look back to ML flow and maybe compare a little bit as well. We look a little bit where it comes from. So the legacy that was in Allegro AI, where it was known, I think, mostly in the community. Then uh, the lean stack idea of this ML ops stack that we have there. And then you will have basically different clear uh, ML products, which are very ni nicely intertwined. So they really work together. Uh, like a charm, I would say. And I pick here just one small example that you see how easy it can be to use this tool partly. And then at the end, we'll, of course, more point to Kurt's demo, because basically after die talk, then Kurt has half an hour of maybe even more, depending also on questions and so on from you um, to really show clear ML in action, which is perhaps much more insightful than, uh, you know, basically having here a tutorial in, in theory. Um, at the end, still, I want to reflect shortly on our unique AI framework again and where clear ML, of course, plays a role uh, perhaps in the future. So let's start with a little bit of the foundations. So uh, foundations, again, of course, needs a little bit of view into machine learning practice. And I think when you know a little bit about machine learning, usually can have the three ingredients that all machine learner is facing. You want to have, uh, you know, to understand something, where's a pattern. So basically you wouldn't go for, a, let's say, a number generator, which is artificial or basically where there's no real pattern in it. So you would always look at something where you try to get, you know, the learning piece out in order to uh, basically think and learn a, a model um, that we basically generate out of this. And I come to this in a moment. But of course, this pattern or this idea is, is relatively important in this. Then, of course, the second ingredient is there's not really an exact mathematical formula necessary. So weather prediction, for instance, can be enriched with machine learning, but there are already very much established formulas, physical models um, based on known physical laws um, that they actually just go ahead and implement. There is no point necessarily of re inventing these with method, basically with machine learning, you just go ahead and implement those. And then of course, the third in ingredient is basically that data should exist. Um, that is very clear here in the race context. This is of course quite interesting because this data might be not just data generated by some measurement device, but could be also scientific simulations like let's say some um, turbulence flow of an aircraft wing. So what we perhaps analyze. So this is of course something where um, you see that this physical models and the physical formulas of course can let's say benefit from machine learning in one respect, but you would not basically necessarily completely say they, you always do now machine learning. On the other hand, there's surrogate modeling, which basically tries to a little bit do this. So can we reduce in the complexity of the physical models to have some machine learning surrogate models instead for some, let's say, cheaper computation in the end. Because some of those, uh, which for instance are direct numerical simulations, the computational footprint is extremely uh, tough on the HPC machines. When you think about wind wheels or a whole wind farm that we have in race, this is of course outrageous. So there machine learning definitely can help again uh, to help in the process. So in a way, machine learning then has this character and it has, of course, overlaps with data mining, with statistics, and all of them share this new common paradigm called data science, which is then really uh, requiring also the high capacities of computing these days, going in line with the developments of deep learning technologies, which are really requiring orders of magnitudes of computing power today. So think about the modus operandi and you see here a very famous model CRISP DM, um, which is actually a bit focused on data mining, but that's not the biggest problem because essentially the iterative approach, the so-called modus operandi is very, very similar when you do AI modeling or machine learning modeling. So it is challenging and it is relating directly why ML ops is, is of relevance. We have different stages, we have different, let's say, um, life cycle aspects. And if you want to say an AI life cycle, then it's certainly something like this and even enriched with much more that we discussed before, the software infrastructure, hardware infrastructure as well. But here you see essentially different steps where you try to understand what you want to do in the AI modeling perhaps. 
then you, of course, as I said, need some data. So the first thing you do is to understand some data, what you got, what you received, uh, in order to prepare the data, maybe much more with feature selection, feature engineering for the concrete modeling in terms of AI. And you see here already the arrows uh, reflect exactly what we do in the community. There's not a one way a function that you implement, like maybe in some other software engineering elements or products that you would do. Here, it's not at all clear in the beginning exactly what model we take. We would say there's a deep learning unit, okay, but how many layers, how many neurons? What basically is the, is the kind of loss function you want to take or what is the optimizer we're gonna use? So there are many different questions that at the beginning you have no idea at all, just the rough understanding. And of course, here and there communities have their, let's say also modus operandi or some lessons learned that they of course know already a ResNet 50 works quite well, but then maybe you want to extend the layers in the ResNet. So I'm talking about these arrows, which mean now for operational aspects are of course complex. You start here creating a model and suddenly realize, well, that model was not good. So let's go back and change the data and create another model. And then you realize you have a problem in the business understanding apparently. So you go back completely and create another model and another and another. So, and this is just essentially the start of all of it. You start with five models, 10 models, different Python scripts enabling all of those. And then of course, thinking about that with feature selection, feature engineering, you also use different data sets all the time with all the different Python scripts. And this is just normal machine learning, normal data sciences. Now think about it in the COE race, we have a complete more complexity underneath because we want to scale to exascale. We have the environment of HPC, which is of course very beneficial for the computing. It gives us lots of possibilities to scale and using many different GPUs instead of one. But on the other hand, introduce of course, much more complexity. Are you running the model on the laptop or are you running the model in a HPC machine in Barcelona? or in Jülich Supercomputing Center, or just an experimental system like the deep system maybe. All of them are of course similar in the way how they operate. They have batch schedulers, they have basically an idea of a parallel file system very often, but still there are these different modules and the different versions of TensorFlow, PyTorch, which also needs to be harmonized. And then when you're on top want to use that with Jupyter, as I was explaining in the framework, you again have to have kernels that actually match these modules on these different systems. And when you do all of this and you maybe have some core hours on the Barcelona system and then you want to move to Jülich to have the new core hours there used, maybe for another project, you kind of have to understand all of these different elements and, and get quickly lost because you have different file system on different sites. So you don't have one clear view. And MLOps is basically, pointing to those, something like this, that you have a one clear view um, of the, all of these different steps, what we just discussed. And I could go on and go on and, and you know, basically there's a devil in the detail, of course, when you now think about hyperparameter tuning, uh, different, let's say, um, elements. But when we look a little bit on this pr practical machine learning overview, where now the computing comes in, where the storage come in and where ML ops can play a good role, is certainly um, this diagram. So basically what machine learning often does is um, you have this data that basically you uh, hinted in. Here's an example of supervised learning, but it doesn't really matter. There's a feature vector and it has a guiding label Y. Um, and you have many of those. Of course, there are requirements for storage. And to keeping track of all these different training samples, because here and there, as I said, you maybe cut a little bit away in a training and test set, that's very clear. You cut more away for validation sets, perhaps, or different validation sets if you swim in data. You maybe want to use different you know, percentages for this, 70 to 30%, 40 to 60%. It always depends how much data you have. So all of these steps are already something which are different operations in the machine learning world, so to speak, where MLOps now can keep track of those and needs to keep track of those because they should be, of course, essentially fitting the model. So what, what constitutes a model now is essentially two things. Um, you see here, which are always basically come together. You have a hypothesis set and the kind of learning algorithm that goes with it. So examples are um, basically neural networks and back propagation or support vector machines and quadratic programming. So there's basically an optimization in the learning algorithm that then uses 
error measures to knock down the error, the so-called loss function also sometimes, to come to something which is hopefully approximating the function that gave rise to the data um, that we, of course, also will never know in many respects. The interesting thing in the COE race is that Sometimes we do know which formulas have created the examples because it was simulations. But in a real, let's say, normal machine learning scenario, um, you basically don't know these aspects. All what you assume is that those have been created by the same probability distribution, essentially that lies over this X space, creating these training examples in the first place. But here's also, of course, now what has to match. So when you have all of these training examples, you have basically this learning algorithms chosen and the hypothesis set chosen. This needs to match and where also more and more of these models come out. So the model would be then hopefully the final version. But as I said earlier, final is a word in machine learning that perhaps you should never really use because you can always optimize. There are new optimizers coming around. Um, people use SGD, stochastic gradient descent, or they using a master of momentum, the Adam optimizer, all new optimizers, which are maybe more powerful because they also take the velocity into account uh, of actually going downhill the error curve or the, or the loss function. But essentially, these are all tunings. And with this tuning, you change the model, right? It's a hyperparameter still. However, you changed the approach. And if you do this, again and again, you will notice that your file system starts collecting many different Python scripts and also collecting, of course, many different data sets. And many people end up of having many, many different folders for that, which is in a way a smart solution. Still, after doing this a long time, you will notice 50 folders with different names and suddenly you lose the overview. And MLOps is a little bit oriented to with this. But what I also just talked to you about is this experiment character. So of course, once we know that this final hypothesis is good enough, let's say for the bank, the recommendations of credit lines for customers is around 60%, that's what they wanted. Then you say, okay, let's go to production. How I do this? So now basically I have basically this model there lying around somewhere, um, how I go and do the next steps, how I deploy that in a cloud to be available maybe 24 seven to the bank, how I be able to maybe retrain the models every month, talking about a workflow basically to renew the models based on new data and then putting it to production again. So the whole workflow or orchestration really of all these different tools is another big facet, which is not shown here, but which of course now is the point where ClearML has products that you can buy, but there's also an open source version available. Let us also say that we are not actually beneficiaries of ClearML in any way, um, just we basically picked that as one possible tool here for um, ex explaining the MLOps character and uh, one possible tool that can play a role in COE race. Now, I hope you understand by now that um, essentially you have now this hypothesis as an almost infinite space, right? So you have many different hypotheses. You can use an SVM machine, an SVM, basically these old traditional models that you see here are still very powerful, especially if you don't swim really in a lot of data. Um, many of you know that actually labeled data is sometimes really rare in some of these scientific use cases. So here and there, these old models can still make a difference, but also they have parameters which you want to change, like a cost or basically also the amount of error that you want to basically allow in these models. And you come to these different models that I'm talking about, right? And of course, they are standing now for all different Python scripts you have been using to doing this. For all the different, let's say, data approaches, you have to feed the data to an SVM, partly different to a neural network or to a logistic regression model that is an example like here, right? You switch different, basically, functions in these models. So this is just a typical small neural um, neuron really, just a linear learning model, one of the simplest learning model, but still already this has lots of facets that you can actually switch. We had talked about the SGD optimizer, you could use another optimizer, um, you can have other activation functions and if you're combining them with the deep learning framework. Just showing you that essentially it's not just the model, the SVM alone versus a neural network versus a deep learning network like a convolution neural network, for example, it's also then looking inside these models and thinking about the hyperparameters. 
And by doing all of this, you will notice the better the model will be, means you probably have spent a lot of time in tuning the different Python scripts, and then suddenly realizing, well, I had a very good idea before, but what was this? Where do I find it? Was it folder 30 or folder 31? So in a way, MLOps is also now again, helping you there to think about the history where you come from and see what have you maybe already tried. You don't wanna do again, let's say a costly run on an HPC system where you have certain quotas on core hours with the same approach again. So you look back in your history and now you have to go through all the folders, very complicated for some users at least and time consuming. Wouldn't it be nice if you would have one GUI that keep tracks of all the experiments and with one click, I can go into the details and see maybe the Python script or I see the output, right? Which we also are highly interested in. Console and output, but maybe also the model output. There are different, of course, ideas. And this is something where the ML approach essentially is targeted at. I said also there's a bigger part of this, which is essentially the workflow, the whole pipelines towards productions um, to really automate the process. Because what I talked about was lots of experimental design, thinking about exploring which of the deep learning networks as an example might be really the, the one of choice, just playing a little bit with this kind of hyperparameter optimization. But then of course the automation and these pipelines towards production is then really where this ops character is in. So where you need a lot of tools for monitoring, is my inference model still online or is there a problem with it? So the customer cannot really actually use it anymore. So it's basically the cloud online that is somewhere doing the computing in one of these pipelines um, and you know having an overview of this. And what about when you want to reproduce some elements? So from other use cases that you maybe have, um, so basically it should maybe enable you when you have one custom in this remain that has the same pipeline almost to reproduce it maybe for another customer or to make, let's say a copy and minorly change it with new data sets and new features. So, and all of this is just essentially in a way, um, two elements, what I just discussed. The, two, the one element is the kind of chaos in data science to really work on all this model, modeling, right? And then the second aspect is the technology, um, which is always moving, which is always thinking about cutting edge. As I said earlier, we had basically no GPUs in the very long past. Now we have GPUs. Now we think about graph processors and we are already doing some modeling on quantum computers. And now when you establish all of this as like these tools, the, one of the key ideas is that the underlying uh, technical infrastructure may change, but the look and feel of your operations of these tools will not. So in a way you deca decouple a little bit this technology Evolvement. And of course, we in HPC are at the forefront of computing, the Formula One of computing, if you will. We are always new chips, new GPUs like the AMD MI100 cards, for instance, now will come along and will change a lot of things. A lot of low level details like libraries, nickel, um, NVIDIA libraries, which will be not relevant perhaps for AMD GPUs. So, how we deal with that? Are the tools really working with this? Um, this is something what maybe you want to hide sometimes from really the machine learning designer that is really an expert in machine learning, but is maybe not the best expert in all the low level details of HPC. And I guess that's why it has so much relationships with our AI framework that we have in mind. And here we think really of um, basically uh, having lots of synergies, um, perhaps in the race project in the CUE, not directly in the whole pipeline approach, although for companies like Atos, but also for Flanders Make, as we know, it is relevant to have maybe also thinking about 24 seven of this usage model. So could we maybe have our ideas of the framework then somehow injected in this frameworks in order to guarantee that they quickly can be rolled out, so to speak, as DevOps would call it in software, basically to the clients, to your users. And you see here a little bit the graphic, it has certainly overlaps um, in this ML ops, um, in this area with DevOps. It shares the same challenges, but machine learning comes with its own challenges. As you have seen, there's no waterfall model precise specification, like in software engineering sometimes, or using nice UML diagrams to say that should be the different models, the different functions, and that's what we implement and want to deploy. Machine learning is an iterative, perhaps partly chaotic process because nobody really knows what the best parameters for a model really are. 
Of course, there are some ideas in the future that we have something like um, essentially hyperparameter tuning automatically, but um, this might be something also where exascale then plays a big role in our idea that basically we can always do hyperparameter tuning automatically because we have already enough computing capacity. In the realm of fairness and time, I think it's time to show you a little bit this video um, from ML Hello, flow to everyone. be a bit fair. If you are watching this video, chances are that you... quick double check is the audio. Um, do you hear it? Yes, the online yes. Yeah, we can yes. hear it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. It's just five minutes, but I think it's fair to then also better contrast it to ClearML later. You are a machine learning engineer or a data scientist, or at least you have at some point uh, worked in the development of a machine learning model. And if that is indeed the case, you certainly know the struggles of every stage of its development until finally making it into production. You can easily get lost in several different machine learning frameworks and tens of different parameters and metrics, especially when there are many people working on the same model. And all those struggles are precisely why MLflow was built and precisely why MLflow is gaining a lot of uh, attraction lately. So, in essence, MLflow is uh, an open source platform for the machine learning lifecycle and, as you can see, uh, is composed of four main modules that can be used independently of one another. We have MLflow tracking, projects, models and finally, model registry. Uh, and the next videos of this MLflow series are an attempt of explaining these four concepts in a very practical way and in a close to real life scenario. For example, uh, in the next video, I'll, I will show you how easy it is to, to start using uh, MLflow in your current model and to keep track of every parameter and metric. So make sure you don't miss it. But without further ado, and uh, in a nutshell, let's talk about these four modules. And let's start with MLflow tracking. As you already know, MLflow uh, tracking allows you to um, keep track of every parameter and metric of your model, but it allows you to do a lot more, like for instance, keep track of the machine learning framework that you uh, use to build your model, uh, all of your code uh, of your project and model, the model version and a lot of other things. So it's indeed a very useful and powerful uh, module of MLflow. Uh, and here you, you can see a screenshot of uh, the MLflow user interface. Uh, in this particular case, the user is trying to search for every run that has a, an R2 higher than 0.24. But this, this is only an example of uh, what you can do with the user interface of MLflow. But uh, the, th the truth is that MLflow, the user interface of MLflow is very, very powerful. You can do a lot of things um, as we will cover later uh, in this MLflow series. And MLflow tracking is essentially this. So let's move on to, uh, to MLflow projects. So MLflow projects is also a very powerful tool of uh, MLflow and without going into details, uh, its main function is to containerize or package uh, your, your machine learning project. And if you have worked with Docker before, the concept is very simil similar. You are basically uh, encapsulating all the dependencies and all the code so it can be run in any machine. And here you can see an example of how a MLflow project should look like. You essentially uh, need to have an ML project where you will define the entry points, the workflow and the path to the Conda environment. And then you will need to have uh, a, con a Conda YML file where you will define uh, all, the all the dependencies that you need and all the libraries that you need for your Conda environment. Um, so your ML flow project should essentially have, it's crucial to have these two files and then you, you need to, to obvious, obviously have the files of your, uh, the code of your model and project of, of course. And uh, ML flow project is basically this, I will go in a lot more 
details uh, in part three of this MLflow series. So now let's move to, to MLflow models. And here the concept is very, very similar to MLflow uh, projects, but this time in this case you, you containerize or package a, a machine learning model. Uh, you can you can use any machine learning framework, and after after you pack the, package your code, you will have basically two ways uh, of loading your model, or two flavors, as MLflow uh, calls it. Uh, basically, you can load your model as a Python function, as you can see here, or using the the flavor of the machine learning framework that you have decided to use, which in this case is TensorFlow. Um, and finally, let's move to, to the model registry, which is where you can actually deploy your model and do so in a very controlled environment. You can stage your model into staging or production, you can create REST APIs to serve the model, and you can automate jobs. It is essentially a MLOps where you can have tools of continuous integration and continuous deployment. So ML, MLflow is essentially this, although it's much more than this. And in the next videos of this series, I will show you in a practical way how to actually start using it. So make sure you don't miss any of these videos. Good. I think we heard enough from him. Um, of course, I refer to YouTube if you want to know more. Um, the reference is given in the slides and will be also then, of course, part of the YouTube video we upload. And um, I think the idea is also that the slides, at least in large parts, will be available if you need it. Um, so um, we've seen many things there. And I guess um, we will come back to this when I now talk a little bit about clear ML as the second part. I really want to take this rather, let's say, just as a kind of overview character, because uh, when now Kurt will demo it, of course, you you have not the whole picture of this product lines that they are there. On the other hand, my things are then, of course, then not res relatively high level. So I think here it should give you just the idea how clear ML is structured in terms of the products. And of course, then we can clearly reflect back to flow ML we just have seen, which has uh, essentially uh, ML flow, sorry, that has also essentially a very, very similar approach. So. Coming to clear ML, it's actually a product which is not really new. I talked earlier that actually it was known as Allegro AI before, um, where the founding team really came from Google, um, basically from, from many different US um, students at that time. And it's quite a successful product if you think about what it means to hold uh, 47 patents in AI and computer vision. So it is quite powerful and can of course help a lot of elements that we found challenging that I tried to motivate in the first part, right? Where maybe it helps to have, um, you know, tools like that. So, and of course, when, when something is helping a user, there's some profit in line. So of course it is interesting that they have, of course, also commercial line, uh, which I will show you just briefly skimming through the website. But there's also an open source track, which makes it interesting for us here in, in the race project. But of course, that means another analysis and evaluation is necessary, what it really entails to have an open source version. So there may be some limits. And I think also Kurt already in his analysis revealed some limits here and there, what is not all usable. And we have to see how relevant that will be becoming when we're talking about computing around exascale. However, for us, of course, it's quite good to note that there are over a thousand organizations all over the world using it already. So it has quite, uh, let's say, stability, which is really very good. And you see here just um, essentially many different vendors, which in a way probably also already have been seeing scale and scalability problems, like you would assume Facebook in a way or NVIDIA as such from the technology point of view, perhaps. So all of those um, actually use already the platform in one way or another. You will also find some cloud vendors from AWS, for instance, that often basically connect to those platforms. And the idea is really to, to integrating these platforms in the whole machine learning workflow that you have, so that you basically use it as another tool. It doesn't mean that you reinvent the wheel and have just this tool. Of course, you need still things like TensorFlow or SkyKit Learn, Conda environments. That's not the 
part of the game. Here we're talking more about what we said about the operational character and the workflows, the pipelines as such, the productization, and then maybe get a little bit away versus cows you have. Um, usually that is existing always um, basically when you do machine learning. So hence ClearML is um, having a high complete stack which they think is still very lean, but you see there are quite some established products and it's getting broader and broader. Of course, also with this uh, profit probably of this gets broader and broader, which is of course also a key goal of such a company. So it's understandable. And as I said in the warm up here in this particular session, I talked to you, it's, it's enormous complexity. So you can imagine that one of these tools here and there is just having a very good overview while the deployment of a whole workload um, that you basically have with different data sets, with different Python models uh, that you have, or even maybe the underlying software changes, you move from PyTorch to TensorFlow. All of these complexities need to be dealt with with different products. However, they have to be together, right? And, and this is something where this ML ops stack here in particular is quite interesting. Um, they really work nicely together. And also the integration of machine learning and deep learning is not that tough that we will see later. Um, which is also one of their most marketing here and there when you see it and analyze it. However, um, this is of course a very key requirement because in the end, if it's too hard to be used, um, it would be a hindrance also for users that already seek some quite complexities of using HPC resources, the batch scripts, and then suddenly also have to do lots of things to just enable ML ops, then it would be also not really a useful product. So I think that's an important part. Um, it is really practice oriented, uh, at least from the Google perspective. So really um, thinking about the most concerns, as I said, bookkeeping, logging, what's happening. Um, always thinking about that, you know, machine learning is never finished. It is always a process. You can always get better. That's why also the video of MLflow was pointing out the continuous integration and continuous development cycles that happening, which also are there in machine learning AI life cycles but maybe perhaps to a much more chaotic degree. So here, this is some, something really which, um, you know, ML ops would be for to try to prevent it. And of course, then having a very neat version and very, let's say, seamless version of using data sets, of having an overview of what machine and deep learning models you really did in the past and, and have your different runs now really organized in a much more better fashion than perhaps just putting it in different folders somewhere in the file system. Um, again, um, these are different tools and I think they can actually nicely operate um, with HPC and cloud resources. There's a certain engine that remote execution is enabled. So here we're talking about that it, indeed it's already for distributed computing. So it's not only for let's say Anaconda downloading, working on your laptop local host, here we're talking about a product set that is really scalable. You see that in some of the tools also when we pick some. Um, here is essentially these kind of six core components, I would say, where of course Kurt can go much better into some, let's say, real demos. But already to understand the distributed computing nature, I found it important to think on these two elements. On the one side, we talked about here um, that we have these different models, where this model repository, of course, rings bells. If you think about the ML flow repository, very similar, having different AI models um, that are basically already are computed. And then for this continuous integration, um, you basically want to maybe have this so-called pipeline or the whole process here, um, let's say executed again, that it would be a serving entity that then uses some, let's say, computing power uh, either in the cloud or basically on premise, there are different resources possible here. And of course, what you also want to do when you talk then about production or basically versus real users that maybe pay something for you to have this AI model in practice, right? Let's say the bank, what I was saying as an example for the credit card uh, approval service, maybe if you want and searching your credit line, there needs to be some active monitoring, which actually also shows that the model in practice is really working. So this is just a clear ML deploy product, if you want, right? And all of their unique selling propositions, these products, and you will see a long list when I show you the website in a second. Um, what is also very good, and that's why I show it here from the data side, right? This is also 
often underrepresented because here is of course also something which means you have different object storages, let it be Amazon S3 or MS Azure. You have different cloud vendors that have different, let's say storages available. You have different file systems to deal with. You have to all basically think also a big, a big way about the data that goes alongside the models. And especially of course, if you think about training and test sets, but then also maybe on new unseen data Let's say the credit card approval service, the bank needs to upload somewhere in a data lake, maybe they're, let's say, anonymized customers just with ID, you know, kind of referenced customers to a so-called data lake, which should be then accessible to those systems. What about scalability of computing, scalability of data? So all of this is, in a sense, with these products um, realizable. Um, of course, you pay something for the products, but our hope is also that the open source versions here and there enable many of these features that we see here. And then, of course, um, this model repository is that a little bit also was basically in this ML flow again, has in the comprehensive view of orchestrating a lot of these elements that we need for training. This could also include uh, different data preparation step, steps before you do actually the model training. You have seen Sometimes, you know, that we have different feature vectors to create. You want to do feature selection, maybe removing some of the features. And if you want to automate this process, you really, you basically need such tools to really um, enable you very quickly to copy this or to orchestrate really all of these elements. And then, um, of course, having a repository, which is, let's say, with metadata enabled that you see, as you have seen in the ML flow tool nicely in this UI, all the different parameters, very nice metadata, you understand directly, ah, this was a model with these and these parameters. So instead of going, you know, sometimes somewhere in the Python script and see, ah, okay, my, my learning rate was 0 0.1 uh, or something like this. Of course you can do this, but that would be quite time consuming. So of course, one of the goals of these products is to save time, right, to get overview. And there's a, a very broad space here in terms of these tools what they can do. Um, I think here are the key ones where you say, um, firstly, it's really um, already oriented towards, I think, server-based computing. This is very good for AI tools because usually in the past, it wasn't at all always there. Let's say if you go 10 years back, many of the AI tools like R or so were pretty much more for serial computing or SkyKit Learn and so on, basically. And here we have a tool set which already takes distributed computing as normal right, or cloud computing as normal. That means the whole product series in a way um, is basically already enables us to, to make HPC realistically integratable in this. At least that's in the moment our, let's say, plan and the, the initial analysis reveals it could be done. But of course, Kurt can also show you some insights later on. Um, we have seen elements like the versioning we often discuss, so the different AI model versions. We want to visualize maybe results. So even the output sometimes could be accuracy rates and then I'm happy, but sometimes I need, you know, confusion matrices because maybe there's a class imbalance and I want to really understand is my classifier very good. So you need maybe more matplot lips outputs than just accuracy, let's say, and this is supported. Um, the interesting thing is these GUIs could be done in a group wise fashion. Um, where we already found some restrictions. I think a group support here and there is not always given in all the products in the open source versions. So here you see already some downgrading, of course, as a motivation to buy the product. However, it is possible to do it, to share it with a research group, for instance, and then of course, enable all the data tracking as well. We have learned not only the AI model is important, also the features that you give to the AI model or the production data, the unseen data, so to speak, for a data for inference, um, this is all basically quite well supported. Looking more than uh, on more operational aspects from DevOps, if you want uh, inherited monitoring of the systems, of the whole pipelines, is every pipeline operating correctly or is a cloud failure? Maybe you run out of credits in AWS, so you have to renew the credits. That may be something where suddenly a pipeline broke. The orchestration, maybe a sudden system is suddenly down. We talked about Spark in this ML flow. Spark clusters tend to fail sometimes. So with this, you have to look into this. And when you orchestrate the Spark cluster in the middle of such a pipeline to do some computing for you, um, then of course, this is something also to think about. 
or in the context of race, when you think about that our HPC machines maybe don't use a spark cluster, of course, but our um, HPC machines also go down sometimes, right? They are, let's say, scheduled maintenance. So maybe instead of, you know, using Uli today, I want to use Barcelona today because Uli is just a maintenance. In a way, ML Ops should now enable you to do this move or porting, if you will, in a way, in a click. Uh, and and the, the point is here, the click is a bit um, overstating the complexity that is really in HPC machines. Hence, our framework maybe makes sense to combine because by one click, we change a lot of things in the HPC domain, like different modules I was alluding to. And also, of course, maybe the file system and, and different architecture elements, like, for instance, different accelerators, for example. So, but here you see how that works. You basically interest, introduce the typical Python code that you have already with some so-called clear ML snippet. And here, this is really just two lines of codes they often do. And of course, in many others, you have zero lines of codes if you just use a GUI uh, here and there for monitoring or orchestration. Um, and, and this is something where um, it's relatively straightforward to use. Of course, before doing this, you need a pip install as usually, um, you know, to really install the system first on your uh, computing entity, which you also have to analyze in terms of HPC, how that would be realizable. But then if it really comes to using it, it's almost like just specifying a specific project name and a specific task that you want to do. And the rest is done really from ClearML. And this is a little bit the other explanation here, you would have your let's say environment, uh, let's say it's um, some Jupyter notebook that you have maybe on one HPC machine running. And then here it will upload in, in the experiment manager, how it is called in ClearML. And it enables your scalability. It enables you all the different orchestration features. We talked about the monitoring features, the nice UI that basically was very similar in the flow ML. And also the ClearML, of course, um, GUI is very much, um, that's how powerful really, so you can configure these elements. Um, what I've said also, which is very important, I think for AI is that not only text is captured, um, I think this is basically Python outputs and whatever, uh, what is automatically locked and also the arguments that you give, let's say to the different environments is captured. Um, as I said earlier, matplotlib is for a researcher in AI, uh, very essential for the area under the rock curve to understand this maybe shortly, or as I said, confusion matrices and so on. So it would use a lot of these things um, a lot of time. So it's good that this is tracked in my opinion. And of course, when you think about it in a way, often you just reuse very similar elements of the Python script. In fact, you sometimes just have a change of some hyperparameters for a grid search, for instance, um, then you reuse maybe just the experiment again. And here in this manager, you can just clone, modify, and put it to the same execution queue again so that the clear ML agent, as they call it, can pull it, so to speak, to a real computing resource that is available. So here we see also where the AI framework a little bit can play a role. We have seen also containers in ML flow. Of course, clear ML also supports containers. And um, I think this, this is enough for the experiment to give also Kurt um, some, you know, possibility to share on something new um, here. Basically, you see a little bit the aspects that we have seen in ML flow just revisited in clear ML. Of course, when you have the large pipelines, when you have the, the models that you want to train, you want to bundle them in so-called containers usually. Um, and this is also reflecting on our um, basically AI framework. If you remember, we also talk about singularity, about Docker, about some container options that are part of this framework. And you see here already the logo of Docker and HPC environments. We have more often singularity, but still um, Docker container or Docker image files really can be also used in singularity. Here and there you have to tweak something, but it is a path that also here HPC services could dock on to this clear ML environment. And you see here the same principles that we use in HPC with the job scheduler already, of course, are, of course, integrated um, in the sense of maybe also having one HPC today, but maybe also go to cloud computing then when you move to production. So in a sense, this remote execution is really inside, which is important to pool essentially all the different resources you have 
in one way, we could also say it for us here in RACE, we can maybe there see a pool of resources from the deep system, the Jubel supercomputer in Jülich and the Barcelona Mare Nostrum system, for example. And then of course, others um, maybe that evolve here in Iceland. So in the end, it's a really dynamic pool, nicely um, so-called managed by a call, tool called Kubernetes, which is also open source and very often used uh, basically in data centers today. And by doing this, essentially, you enable data scientists that they don't care about all of this, what you see on the left-hand side. So normally, what you have to do is to create your own, let's say, Docker file. You basically create what's inside the container. You basically have to do lots of different steps. You have to then upload the container to some form of repository and then to be reused later, downloaded, so to speak. All of this is essentially now much more quicker here when we use this clear ML package uh, using then automatically these features of the Kubernetes engine, which is quite powerful actually. And that's why it's used in many data centers today. Uh, what ClearML can do nicely from my investigation was also then think about costs. So you, of course, every cloud costs in HPC, we have the, 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 the lucky situation that it really not really costs, but you can transfer the cost model to the core hours available for researchers. So in the end, we also need that. And I think they're having an overview of the utilization on the one hand, the scale that you need in your application and the cost uh, looked for me also quite interesting. The question is there how much we can really dive there in with HPC uh, and doing it on our own premises. Um, just to give you a low level short example, what that now really means, there's two lines I already had in this kind of snippet that you put in um, really more on a high level point of view. Uh, you have your typical, let's say, um, SQL learn here. I showed you logistic regression in, in one of the earlier parts here, um, where you essentially just clear ML integrate this Python package. You use a task from it and then specify a project name and a task name. And that's all what you essentially have to do to really use this particular clear ML experiment product. What then happens, it will basically uploads it. And of course, as I mentioned again here, don't forget that of course, before that you have to install it. And then you have so-called ClearML hosts. I think Kurt will probably talk about more of this, but essentially you see that it's a very seamless way of integrating this um, in a non-parallel way. So when we see going to HPC environments that may be a little bit more complicated. But essentially here we see a very nice uh, way of integrating it just as any other Python library. What then happens once this is executed, you maybe let it run in a Jupyter notebook or PyCharm or whatever you have as let's say the running environment. It will basically now put this and upload this to this ML experiment product. And then you can nicely look with the URI that probably will be also see very soon in the live demo from Kurt, um, where you then essentially have all the outputs in one that central overview and a very nice, let's say collection where you can of course organize it a little bit like you want. You have the different dates, the different, let's say projects you work in, but also then can move one level deeper. You have the different jobs that you run here, all the training jobs, the same is true for inference jobs. You have experiments and model sections here and uh, see always basically the people who did it. So who from the group was doing it, how long it is of course, uh, was it the go where you run the models, but then you go one level deeper. And I think the demo will show that much more. You can go to the results. So again, having the outputs of the models, maybe let's say some output in accuracy, or as I said, also the confusion matrices. And of course, now we have an overview and like MLflow, this UI is of course a tremendous help in a way, um, basically to the AI researcher which maybe helps here and there the operations of the model. And then of course you can go from there and think about really the production mechanisms. So just finally coming back because now Kurt is basically hopefully warming up already your demo and so on while I maybe conclude my introductionary talk. I could have talked about this product sets and we left a couple of products out actually, but um, it's not that important. I think you get the key concepts of MLOps and also where we probably can dock on. You see also that basically in a way we, we think mostly about on a very, let's say high level about this with the machine learning flow or let it be clear ML to really be very close to essentially the user environment with this kind of task that we integrate in the Python script. But you have also seen it has huge implications then on the lower level 
what container environment is existing. So in this sense, here is some role to play for the reference architecture and the model to think about this interaction. If people, let's say Atos decides to use MLflow in production with this uh, tools or basically with the framework that basically was invented in, in race, how that actually relates now also to the lower level entities of containers and so forth, um, and which is, of course, one of the things we will engage and we'll probably will talk about in one of the future seminars. Right, and that's all I wanted to leave here on the table for you, some references. I have to say many of the experiences we learned in these environments is due to a very good team of my students here. So I also should acknowledge every now and then very much um, really having all these inputs from these good people. So, Kurt, how are you? Hopefully I'm not on. asleep. <laughs> no, uh, certainly not. Um, yeah, th thank you for uh, for this invitation uh, to talk here, Maris. Um, uh, but you only left me three minutes of my thirty minutes slot, uh, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I see. It was a little bit later. We we started also, and uh, but in a way, I mean, just go ahead and and see the demo, and maybe here and there people can, if you like, also in maybe just interrupt and, and ask what happens if you click there, if you click there. Um, we could also do it like this in a way. And thank you very uh, much, of course, for, for talking about your live demo. That's very nice. OK, I, I first I also have some slides. Um, uh, I, I have uh, section zero on uh, yeah, what is Flanish make, but um, well, maybe I'll go very quickly over that. Um, then what is ClearML? Well, everyone knows by now. Um, then there is a um, live demo, which I uh, titled, Whoa, so pretty. Um, and then I'll uh, go in into a few gotchas uh, that they are a bit too. Uh, this is mostly what, what you won't find on the um, uh, publishers or, or the company's website and is just most interesting. Um, uh, okay, so um, yeah, Flanders Make is a research institute in Flanders for the manufacturing industry. Uh, there are four divisions or clusters, we call them, um, decision and control, um, which includes a lot of AI research uh, these days, uh, design and optimization, uh, motion products and, and flexible assembly. Um, and it's spread all over Flanders. Um, most of our uh, additive manufacturing operations uh, happen in Leuven. I myself based in Lommel, um, but Flanders is not very large. So that's not a big problem. Um, we have four sites where we have uh, quite some infrastructure. Um, also spread over Flanders. Um, and in race, uh, we look uh, at uh, improving additive manufacturing. Uh, that, that is uh, 3D printing. Uh, so uh, you, you start with the CAT model. Um, you um, have some software processing to um, convert the CAT model into uh, slices uh, of a uh, uh, number of uh, microns thick. Um, and each of those layers is printed in sequence in a printer. Um, and in the end, you, you have an object that still uh, most likely needs some form of finishing. Uh, we, we have a, a few um, experimental setups. Um, and, and in race, we, we use this uh, rather large uh, metal 3D printer. Uh, which uh, prints uh, stainless steel objects. Uh, so you, you have a, a, a bathtub, more or less, uh, of, of uh, steel powder, and you heat it locally with a, a powerful laser, and then it, um, it melts locally and uh, it sticks together, uh, or it form, becomes solid, and that way you create an object. Uh, you add some more powder over the object, you. Um, locally heat that again and so on, uh, and add layer by layer in that way. Um, it looks neat in the 
previous uh, slide, but actually it's pretty messy. Um, so this, this is a very dynamic uh, and, and high speed process where uh, yeah, it's uh, hard if you want to do it very quickly to just create liquid, you also have some vapor forming and, and that creates pressures. And so it, it's a, a very um, a dynamic process. Um, so to follow what happens there, uh, you, you have to have very high bandwidth sensors. Um, uh, we, we do that um, amongst others with cameras uh, at uh, 20,000 or more frames per second because everything happens so quickly, otherwise you don't see what's happening. Um, and then um, also the, um, yeah, the hypothesis space is quite large. Uh, you need a lot of data to validate all of these hypotheses. Um, and this space is large because uh, cause and effect can be rather distant and, and can belong to, uh, or usually do belong to different layers in the object. You have reversal of effects and so on. Um, anyway, uh, but let's uh, let's rather talk about MLOps. So there are uh, yeah many MLOps tools and new ones appear uh, every month almost. Um, there are a number of popular ones. Uh, this is not necessarily all of the popular ones, but yeah at least uh, reasonable very short uh, subset. Um, there's ClearML uh, until uh, a year ago about uh, known as strains, as uh, Morris already mentioned. ML flow, as Morris already mentioned, DVC. Um, and, and then there are also the very commercial or really expensive tools uh, as Converge, now uh, part of Intel. And weights and bias is uh, also quite popular, I, I believe. Um, uh, ClearML is um, also a commercial operation, right? So uh, Allegro AI business model is to provide uh, software as a service. Um, but you also have the option to, um, uh, to uh, roll your own stuff, uh, as we'll see. So um, the advertised two lines uh, of code is actually five lines. Uh, so if pip install ClearML, as Morris already showed, you also have to uh, do a ClearML init. Um, otherwise, it doesn't know where to write um, its uh, logs or how, which server to talk to, essentially. Uh, and in, um, in, in your Python script, um, it needs to be Python. It, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't work with any other language. Um, so you, you say, okay, uh, import ClearML um, and um, you, you initialize your task. So you provide some arbitrary project name and uh, arbitrary task name. Um, and um, that's it. Um, and uh, the task connect uh, registers in this case, the, the configuration file of, of my training script. Um, it, uh, this is a, a regular, um, this can be any uh, Python dictionary, but it's automatically recognized as such, and um, it's automatically um, displayed in the user interface later. Um, if, if you use very popular um, um, APIs, uh, say TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, tensor board logging and so on, that's uh, all recognized automatically. Um, so you don't have to do anything else uh, than this. Uh, some popular operations such as writing to standard output uh, with your script or saving images from the training script are also automatically intercepted and, and uploaded to the server. Sometimes it's a bit too much, sometimes it's a bit too little, and you can then fine tune this by adding a little bit more code uh, elsewhere in your training script. Uh, but so that's a basically, uh, this is the basic configuration, and usually that's pretty close to what you actually want. So it's uh, as long as you, you uh, only use very popular APIs, it's uh, it's uh, very good at guessing what you what you would probably want. 
Um, so it's uh, client side, so server side. Um, you have uh, two options. Uh, they, they provide a, a pseudo open source uh, server, which is hosted, uh, which you host yourself, or you can do uh, choose one of the software as a service tiers. Um, you can do it free if you are only three, uh, a club of three. Um, if if you, you have a bigger operation, then, uh, then it becomes uh, somewhat pricey, but yeah, not necessarily uh, un unaffordable. Um, uh, for, for Pro, which is, so both Free and Pro have, as far as I know, exactly the same features as self-hosted, except for some uh, security features. Um, well, except that it talks over um, TLS, except uh, instead of uh, regular HTTP, um, essentially. Um, an enterprise has more features, uh, but they have, don't have a list price. So if you have to ask for the price, it's probably too, too expensive for you. Um, the, the server is a composition uh, in, in its basic instantiation. So the public uh, version, at least, is a composition of uh, a number of standard dockers. Um, they, they provide a, a Docker composer file, so it's uh, very easy to um, to run an instance in its basic form. Uh, it's composed of a MongoDB database uh, and uh, yeah, elastic search for search, of course, and a Redis uh, cache. Um, and their API service is the thing that actually does uh, most of the work. Um, Okay, so let's let's visit uh, an actual server. Um, voila, Th this is, uh, and now of course everything will go wrong as you usually does in a, a live demo, right? Um, this is an actual ra uh, test server that we set up and have been uh, testing with several people. Um, just to see what it does. Uh, we mostly use uh, ClearML experiment. Um, so uh, let's look at this project, for example. This, um, well, this is uh, running at the moment. Um, well, let's see what it's doing. Um, this is accidental, right? So it's actually someone else who is using this thing right now. Um, um, so, okay, he's training this, um, and you can monitor the machine state, the GPU state, uh, and, and the loss. Um, so the, the normal tensor board uh, figures are all here. Uh, you can easily zoom in and out. You can download the data. Um, if the software saves any images, they will appear here. You see all of the console output and so on. Um, there is the, the configuration of, um, of the tool. So um, the, the config file is, is uh, here present in, in the GUI. It's uploaded to the server and uh, available for everyone to see. Um, and also the, the script he's using, you can you can find back the commit. Um, and if he had any uncommitted changes, which is indeed the case here, then, then it, they appear also here because uh, sometimes the, the commit is not really what, what you run and you don't want to commit uh, for every single experiment necessarily. Okay, so far, um, let's go back to our... Um, yeah, you can of course zoom in and out, and 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 you can have um, like projects with uh, sub projects and so on. Um, um, Kurt, can I have a short question in between just to understand it better? Yeah. Maybe all forever. Uh, which option you have chosen to try it out? Do you use your your own premise free, or do you yeah. use uh, free in the cloud? Or so you installed the, the service the, on your is... premise. 
Th this is on, on uh, ah, my own. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw the URI now. OK, yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, of course, we can link a domain name entry to their uh, service, but we don't. So this is uh, the, the free version. Um, let's see what is also interesting. Um, well, let's look here. Oh, yeah, that, this is uh, nice to show. So you can easily compare experiments. Um, so you see the changes or uh, all uh, parameters. Um, uh, whatever. Um, let's look at uh, the learning curves. OK. Um, so here my my colleague said, oh, well, this um, I tested uh, this augmentation and, and it doesn't work on, on my kind of data. It doesn't work at all. Look, um, and yeah, OK, we see here uh, the the loss uh, on the validation set increases uh, over time. So that is that is not good, right? So this you, you never want to see that that clear, clearly something is wrong and and the normal experiment without this augmentation it it's uh, it does show a decreasing uh, validation loss um and it's also much lower loss which uh, yeah um yeah our our uh, vote loss for some reason our uh, we don't yet know why why this is zero <laughs> actually but um at least this number is, is correct. Um, and so indeed, there is a problem if you look at the output, there is a problem and so on. So um, now the the claim is, OK, this, this doesn't work. Um, then you have a look at the hyperparameters. Um, OK, let's let's hide all identical fields. And we can easily see what, sh what, what is the difference between these experiments. So what is different? Yeah, this augmentation uh, type of cutout here is it used, and here it's not used. That's the basic difference. But look here, the um, the, this, the input scale is also different. Uh, and yeah, we know since the uh, especially since the efficient um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, what, what's the name again? Uh, efficient whatever. <laughs> Uh, the, the Google paper. Um, efficient net, uh, I would say, yeah. Yeah, efficient or... net, uh, of, of course. Uh, but yeah, there's also uh, efficient uh, debt and so on, so uh, which are derivative works. But uh, so originally efficient net. Um, we know that input resolution is quite important for, um, for accuracy. So I said, yeah, OK. But yeah, we when we're not entirely sure whether it's the augmentation or the resolution that's the, the big difference. Uh, admittedly, the augmentation is a, the likely culprit because changing resolution shouldn't um, have your validation loss increase over time. But still, uh, why don't you run an experiment um, uh, with uh, the same uh, resolution and maybe uh, half uh, the, the augmentation, uh, not not maybe also show something from the original data set, not not only augmented images. Um, so my colleague did that, um, and then uh, that that's it. This experiment. Um, Uh, and then if you look at, at, at those um, uh, losses, then um, the, the loss is, is again uh, much, much lower and, and thus decrease over time. So um, yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can compare. Um, uh, yeah. uh, I can show all three in a comparison. Um, here, um, so if you look here, so um, th this is the, the bad experiment, but now with 
uh, high resolution and, and moderate augmentation with a rate of a half um, rather than one. You, you have essentially the same convergence uh, while also having uh, in um, real world uh, images a bit of protection, uh, prov uh, a bit of robustness provided by this augmentation method. Um, okay. Um, that's how, how the server looks like. Um, maybe another question or you maybe come to this in no. a moment i don't know how many gpus you have used i mean was this scalable in terms of your own infrastructure that you could um, connect the the containers with each other or you know what i mean kind of multi-gpu setups um or do you have it put it on a cluster at your site or <laughs> you, you will probably talk about this a bit now. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll okay. come. Yeah. So this is a Perfect. very small scale uh, test. Um, this run on, yeah, technically multi GPU machines, but uh, most of our training sessions are actually more um, efficient on just a single GPU. That is, they they go faster if you have multiple, but. Yeah, uh, you don't get linear uh, speed up even with two GPUs. Um, it, it, it's different for every uh, every model, right? So of course uh, it, it depends, uh, and it depends a lot. Uh, but it, this is a very small scale test, just to see: the, is it useful? Can it help us? Um, we we mostly use a ClearML experiment only. Um, we we don't use a scheduler or the agent uh, currently, but we're looking into that. Um, so th there's more to it uh, than, than I showed. So you have an agent, uh, so you can, yeah, they, they provide a daemon that you run on, on your compute nodes. And that just looks at the queue on the server and um, it takes whatever it finds on that queue. Um, the agent can set up a Docker container, um, not a singularity container though. Um, and uh, it, it can integrate with Kubernetes. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster, then it should work. We we don't, so we uh, we don't we haven't tested that. Uh, um, so it's a it's a simple queue. It's not a sophisticated multi-priority queue like a typical uh, supercomputer, and there is no integration. Um, whatsoever with PBS or Moab or Slurm, um, it's there is only this agent and and that takes that looks at the queue and that's it. Uh, what what it does do is it can tell you who was the user that submitted the job, but that's that's about it. Um, so if you want in, uh, good integration on on a on a supercomputer system, you you're gonna have to write some code for that yourself. Uh, at the moment, as far as I can tell. Um, th that is f for, um, at, at least for the, the free version and also for the free and the pro tier of software as a service because they have the same features. The enterprise tier, I, I don't know what it can do. Um, they, they claim that has dynamic scheduling, whatever, whatever it means. Um, uh, it, it comes with a, a small uh, data management component. Um, I, I looked at the code of that, um, and it's surprisingly small uh, in, in terms of code size. So it's very lightweight um, in terms of complexity, which is good, um, but you, you don't get the, the kind of uh, features that you get with uh, data led which is on top of git and then you get all the git features uh, for free um not not with clear ml data so you have uh, file sets that are marked immutable at some point and and then yeah they're just there um and you can inherit from uh, multiple previous data sets to make a new data sets with additional files and directories or with omitted files and directories. 
Um, and, and that's it basically. What, what's in the files is totally uh, unimportant for clear ML, it's just files. Um, you, you can, think, I think, even ask of differences between files. It will just say uh, these files are different and that, that's it. Um, uh, the server scalability, yeah, we, we only tested a uh, very, very small scale, uh, but at that small scale, the server is uh, lightweight. So um, after 43 experiments, it, it takes uh, two gigabyte on disk and three gigabyte of RAM, mostly for the elastic search server. Um, and, and the rest is uh, um, neglectable. Um, that is including even the, the containers and, and stuff. So um, it, it's almost almost nothing. Um, however, how will it scale to a really large scale environment? Yeah, that's hard to say. Um, it, it doesn't use that much CPU in our tests, but if you're going to use it somewhere approaching exascale, then yeah, that's a different matter. Uh, yeah, the, the default free server uh, is a, a Docker composer script. Yeah, it's single server by default. Yeah, that's not probably not gonna make your exascale machine run if it's bottlenecked by the single node, even if that node doesn't have to do uh, a whole lot. But I, I don't know, so we, we haven't tested this. Uh, so there is a question, is it open source? Uh, the strict, strictly spoken, it's not open source. The client is, but the server has a license called server side public license. That's not OSI approved open source, um, but it's pretty close. It's, it's uh, closely related, related to uh, AGPL, the Ferro GPL. And for our uh, Flanders make, that is uh, intents and purposes, that's good enough. That's, uh, um, that's fine. Um, and you can find it on GitHub, but yeah, you can put anything on GitHub with any license, I guess. Um, so that doesn't tell you very much, but at least you can look at the code. Um, Uh, the, the security is uh, totally omitted from the free server version. Um, that means there are uh, no user groups, no permissions. That is, if you log into the server, you see everything from anyone. Um, and and you, uh, if you, the server runs, has agents connected to it, then, then you can put whatever in its queue and it will just execute it. Um, also, the uh, the default for the server, if you launch it, is to just run unauthenticated free for all, um, which is mostly not what you really want. Uh, so to even have it verify user credentials, you have to provide this script to, to the server. And exactly this script, if you do a slight variation, <laughs> then it won't work and it um, will just allow everyone in, uh, um, which is also um, probably not what you want. Um, and it, it doesn't speak TLS so, or SSL. The, the, the old uh, name was uh, SSL, right? Uh, Transport layer security. So it um, it's plain HTTP. And you cannot configure it to use TLS. It's, uh, I looked at the code. It's basically impossible uh, unless you, you uh, significantly rewrite uh, parts of, of the code. Um, so you essentially have, if you want encryption, then, then you have to run a TLS terminating proxy in front of this server. Uh, fortunately, it's all HTTP, all, all three different um, endpoints, so it's, it should be possible. Um, the, the client does speak TLS because the software as a service, of course, does use TLS. Uh, so that, that should work if you can have a proxy, but also we didn't test this uh, so far. Uh, backups uh, can maybe also be a, a 
an issue. So you, you can have access to MongoDB, of course. Um, but there is no GUI tool or so to, to move individual experiments, tasks between servers to download them, to migrate them. Uh, and there is no online backup script. So if you want a consistent backup that uh, has a consistency between its MongoDB and Elasticsearch and whatever else that it uses, that, that's going to be difficult while keeping the server up and running, uh, probably. So that's also a concern if you want to use this in heavy production environment and 24-7 operation, that's uh, going to be tricky. Um, OK, uh, that's it. Um, Thank I'll you very much, Kurt. Here. That was really good, very good insight. And but it really shows some insights in the practicality there. I just thought you, because we were guessing so much, there is an overview on the website here. I just found, you know, where you have all the different products we mentioned, but on a very high scale. But saying, you know, in the different self-hosted free tier professional enterprise, what they can and what they cannot do. And of course, obviously, the, the, the SAS, software as a service, full enterprise one, has the best options here on the right side. And the left one, which is a free one, leave out a lot of things. So um, dynamic job scheduling, I see here, it might be important for us uh, and things like that. So... In the end, it's also the question, at least we should be interoperable in race, right? We maybe don't need to to be, you know, taking this completely on us to say everybody has to run such a thing, but at least to see that our models that we're going to do are actually, you know, somehow integratable. And I think with the Python approach they have, and indeed, I agree, I don't found anything else. It seems like just Python, but 90% of data science is Python. Um, there, of course, it's it's something to think about. However, for race, we know they are C and Fortran code, so <laughs> this uh, is something to think about. That was a good presentation. Um, question and answers from the community here on the call, please, before we close. I check the chat. I think there's nothing really in terms of questions. Okay, people are shy a little bit. Or maybe can already go to the thanks. There are no questions. So basically parts of it will be also uploaded on YouTube. So you can rewatch it. Uh, Kurt will have his, uh, have his parts not really uploaded, but I'm sure Kurt is accessible for questions via email and so on. So, and we are all race. Of course, we will keep you informed how we will adopt this. To how far we will adopt this. And of course, also, what is the difference between ML flow? Because that would be one question finally for Kurt. Uh, if you would combine both, um, you said you also looked into this a little bit. What were your findings there? You said a little bit more whistle has one of it and, and so on. Uh, I, I'm personally, I haven't tried ML flow. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I can't really uh, go into the details there. Okay. Yeah, it um, looks to me very similar. However, I, I found ClearML indeed a bit more nicer looking. But this might be just, um, let's say, a, a takeaway message. On the other hand, I think um, I'm surprised that we that they don't really have schedulers somehow integrated with PBS and so on. But this might be another of the product line that we didn't really discuss it. But um, yeah, thank you very much again, Kurt. If there are no questions, then I would now... Uh, basically close just with a couple of um, you know appetizers for the next seminar so first of all if you want to have more information um, about this seminar but also of course about any other elements about race please uh, go to our website there's also the possibility to contact us um, keep tuned for our unique AI framework and its evolution and basically how we integrate also the new hardware infrastructures and that gives me the possibility also to think about the next seminar. The previous seminars can be, you basically looked at in YouTube. We are a little bit lacking behind due to the summer break and vacation periods from us uh, of uploading those to the YouTube channel of Race. But you will see in, in let's say, uh, maybe a week or two, we will have all the previous seminars finally uploaded. 
and will be accessible to you. And uh, the one that we planned for October that we a little bit shifted now from September was the one on uh, basically using now this interesting intelligence progressing and uh, processing units, sorry, IPUs from GraphCore. So this is a new approach of really thinking about when you think about TensorFlow, what it creates really to execute AI models, it creates a DAC underneath a directed asynchronous graph. Because in the end, the workflows that we have seen or the modeling and so on, and this is all little pipelines and little workflows. So in the end, you're back to a graph. And this would be interesting to have hardware that naturally supports these topologies. And I think this is a very interesting seminar uh, in more ways than one. Not only is it a very new technology, um, we had also some contact already with this, uh, basically with GraphCore, and they are also a very, let's say, uh, nice set of members. So we will try to have a very nice seminar with them in October that you see a little bit what is this IPU about, how we can use it with basically AI and ML, and maybe contrast it a little bit to the normal accelerators that are there. And that was the seminar for today. Thank you very much for joining us or watching us and try to be back for the next seminar. Thank you very much.